All right, what an honor it is to be in uh, this uh, workshop today and to be with such uh, a, a stellar lineup of groundbreaking scholars to be a part of this conversation. Uh, so I wanna begin with the premise that I'm not interested in what metabolism is, except insofar as it helps us to understand specific turning points in world history and specific patterns of development of power, profit, and life. And so I want to avoid the uh, young Hegelians uh, problem that Marx and Engels uh, critique in the, the German ideology, that what ends up happening most of the time is that people throw phrases against other phrases and then celebrate themselves for being correct or smart or otherwise uh, intellectually correct. So let's look at two decisive methodological and philosophical dilemmas around metabolism. Metabolic rift or metabolic shift, that is, do human social formations have a metabolism, or are they, from farms and family formation to financialization, metabolic arrangements as such? A world of intellectual and interpretive difference turns uh, on one's answer. And then, is this a matter of positive ontology, or is it dialectical abstraction? Most deployments, not all, most deployments of metabolism proceed through the erasure of history common to the bourgeois epistem. The procedure is unfortunately familiar to us all, define what metabolism is, and then enclose history within that definition. This is the language of case study, for instance, although many case studies uh, seek to push back against that enclosure. Now, the world ecological alternatives is metabolisms become. Again, leaning on uh, Zimmerman, there is no pre-existing uh, uh, essence that uh, is in, entrained within coal or within wheat or within sugar, uh, that coal is only a rock in the, in the ground, for instance, only under definite historical geographical relations of capital, class, life, and empire does it become a fossil fuel. So the emphasis that I want to make here is precisely against the flight from history that I see within many so-called critical and eco-socialist circles and into a world historical materialism that understands modernity as a world ecology of power, profit, and life. That is, that capitalism is a metabolism, a set of metabolic arrangements combined in uneven layers within layers. So in this procedure, metabolism opens an imminent critique and therefore a reconstruction of historical capitalism as a world ecology. Now, this leads us to a fundamental set of questions because we are fighting against the backdrop of bourgeois naturalism, man versus nature, and the drive to uh, manage that, to bring that into harmony with each other. And that is fundamentally an imperialist epistem and a way of seeing that is uh, uh, historically related in the closest possible ways with globalizing patriarchy and uh, with the world color line as modes of super exploitation, not just of human work, but of the work of nature as a whole, the work of the bioterriot. So we are looking at how do we put together questions of metabolism and questions of class power, of course, in a relentlessly heterodox way, as those of you who might be familiar with my work would, would uh, imagine. So uh, the, the issue here, what's at stake is man and nature and the way that, that uh, these anti-politics of planetary management have intruded very, very strongly into academic life and indeed into folk concepts, as well as the eco-industrial complex uh, that in my view should be regarded as a pillar of neoliberalism. So this is, above all, a politics of harmonization of man and nature abstractly conceived and conducive to technological fixes and rational management, again, abstracted from the class dynamics of historical capitalism. The world ecological alternative sees things differently. It sees the climate crisis today as one expression of the worldwide class struggle in the web of life forged during the long cold 17th century, the very worst of the little ice age, when we see the initial formation of the climate, climate class divide, climate patriarchy, and climate apartheid. So from this vantage point, every wave of capitalism produces, but is also produced by uneven and combined metabolisms 
And the generative sources of these metabolisms range from the solar system to agrarian class structures, to bodies, to uh, dynamics of uh, modes of reproduction and family formation. Uh, we are looking at uh, the generative sources as being inside, outside, and connective at different historical geographical moments. So here I wanna run through just a few thoughts from Marx and Marx and Engels as kind of elements of a conversation around a dialectical and historical conception of metabolism. And uh, the first is routinely ignored. This is Marx and Engels' uh, classic statement of historical materialism in the German ideology, in which he precedes, they precede the discussion of class formation, class society, phases of capitalist development with this rather remarkable passage, which ends, as you can see, all historical writing must set out, set out from these natural bases and their modification in the course of history. So this is often forgotten. It's dropped from the frame. People don't want to put it into play, but this is fundamental to Marx and Engels' uh, thinking. Uh, we want to understand as well that the, uh, the question of class formation, uh, the classic statement from Capital Three is here. And so what we want to do in, in these two slides I'm going to show you is to put all of these moments into conversation with each other so that each moment is transformed by the other. Of course, never evenly, always in historically and geographically situated ways. Of course, the history of class society is the history of class struggles. Class struggle is an ontological premise, not an epiphenomenal form. Uh, that man confronts the materials of nature as a force of nature himself, that as through the labor process, there is a conception, a labor-centered, a class-centered way of understanding the labor process and the web of life, that humans are themselves natural forces, and in transforming external nature, they are transformed themselves. What apply He introduces this very early in Capital in order to set the stage for the rest of the analysis. Uh, uh, one of the crowning passages, uh, very uh, favorites of eco-Marxists everywhere, is the degradation of the soil and the worker, which comes as the culminating moment of his discussion of the transition to large-scale industry. That is what is commonly referred to as the Industrial Revolution. So I'm not interested in Marxology. I'm interested in what these kinds of comments can do for our historical frames, our narrative strategies, our methodological procedures, that is method in terms of what are we bounding and how are we bounding questions and relations of power, profit, and life. So in this, webs of life include class society, which not only produces changes in the web of life, more on that in a moment, but is a product of them. And so we want to get a sense of this class dynamic, this environment making dynamic as central to class formation, class politics, class struggle as really central because it will become fundamental to the intellectual and political tasks of advancing a planetary justice agenda in the present moment. And above all, it involves confronting the geocultural structures of nature with the uppercase N that I will return to, but above all, to the ways in which women, nature, colonies, peoples of color, race, for instance, gender, and modern sexism was invented through the real and ruling abstraction of nature. We'll come back to this several times across the, the arc of this talk. And so what we want to do is to unthink and, and therefore to escape the prison house of man and nature, which is the uh, uh, essential way that empires looked at the world, because of course, what were they doing? They were uh, bringing the civilizing project, the, the best that man had to offer to all the lazy, irrational, savage, barbaric peoples everywhere in the world. Uh, so this long history of imperial bourgeois naturalism is, of course, the face of the Anthropocene today, the popular Anthropocene in any event, uh, asking, are humans overwhelming the great forces of nature? That is precisely the wrong question to ask, and it is one, it is a question fraught with political implications. The alternative, again, is to see not man and man in nature, but let's take these as dialectical shorthands, if you will, climate and class. This is a metabolic, dialectical, historical relation implicated in recurrent civilizational crises across the long durée, including the present crisis. 
So I said man and nature is fraught with political implications. One of the major ways this is so is, of course, in the, the common uh, um, sort of jokey question of why is it easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism? And indeed, the, the, the short answer is because uh, of the eco-industrial complex that emerges after 1968, they reinstall man and nature at precisely the moment when that logic has been discredited by a worldwide peasant student and worker revolt. And so that's a longer story we can get into, but it's implicated to a grand historical erasure, which is the erasure of popular revolts in recurrent climate crises in the history of capitalism and well before. Here we have a uh, uh, ta uh, talk from the left uh, clockwise is the Grand Jacquerie in 1357, uh, the Haitian Revolution in 1791, and of course a highly stylized painting, but one of the Goths crossing the Danube in 376. The Goths were uh, the climate refugees of the fourth century. There's a longer history to be told of this, but essentially before the Dark Ages cold period in the middle of the fifth century, uh, the Eurasian steppe experiences its worst drought in 2000 years. So we all recognize that the present climate crisis represents a tipping point, a state shift away from the unusual climate stability of the Holocene. The Holocene itself is not very well understood in terms of um, history because of the profoundly anti-historical thrust of both earth system science, but also most environmental social science outside of environmental history. So the, the, uh, the grand rationale is the Anthropocene, the age of humans, the uh, too many babies, too many people, uh, to quote Paul Ehrlich from the late 1960s. Of course, when Ehrlich said too many people, he meant too many brown people. And so there is a, a deep history of uh, Malthusian imperial racism uh, that uh, uh, lurks uh, in the not uh, too far background of today's Anthropocene. So if not Anthropocene, what? Well, Capitalocene, okay. Capitalocene targets capitalism in the web of life, capitalism as a world ecology of power, profit, and life. But no amount of theorizing can resolve and help us to come to grips with the history. We have to understand the history and allow the history to reshape our theory and concepts and methods and vice versa. So here is a proxy of uh, the past 2000 years of climate change in the Northern Hemisphere that uh, um, uh, uh, rather, rather on planet Earth that uh, relates to changes in solar intensity, that's the top, and to volcanic eruptions, that's on the bottom. It turns out, lo and behold, uh, sorry humanists, that uh, volcanism matters quite a bit in the history of humankind and in the history of class society in particular. But what happens if we take a different look at this kind of uh, chart, which by the way is from John Brooks' wonderful book on climate history, and look at this not in terms of man and nature, but in terms of power, reproduction, and life across the long durée. Uh, don't worry, there's a lot of information here and we'll come back to this at several crucial junctures over the next 20 minutes. But essentially what this shows is that moments of dramatically unfavorable climate shift across the past 2000 years, are moments of political and civilizational crisis. Conversely, moments of relatively favorable climate change from the thawing of the Dark Ages cold period to uh, 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 many other eras here, uh, you can see that the, the uh, favorable uh, eras are uh, moments of the resurgence of class society. So for instance, European feudalism forms during the first thaw of the uh, uh, Dark Ages cold period. This is the era of Charlemagne, who faces Neri, uh, an unfavorable cold and rainy spring, the campaign season across his entire life. There's more to it than that, but some of these little facts can stick in our heads and be helpful. So we need to make sense of the Holocene as a whole, because as Rudiman has pointed out, it's extremely unusual that we have this extremely long interglacial period. This is in contrast to the previous 19 interglacial periods uh, that came before the Holocene. And what we see is that precisely between about 8,000 and 6,000 years ago, there is the urban agricultural class society revolution that essentially acts as an Archimedean lever of atmospheric carbonization on a planetary scale and uh, uh, therefore departs from the so-called natural CO2 trend of the previous 19 
interglacials. In other words, the Holocene itself is a result of the methanization and carbonization of the atmosphere and the creation of relative climate stability across this Holocene era. So this connects the very long durée of class society with the somewhat shorter long durée of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, class society in the Northern Hemisphere going back to Rome's third century crisis. Don't worry, we're gonna come back to all of these moments throughout. So one of the takeaways from this is that moments of dramatically unfavorable climate change are bad for ruling classes. They are destabilizing to the extant political, economic, and geocultural arrangements in no small part because they undermine agrarian relations, but there's much more to it than just that. But to give you this idea from the long 5th, 14th, 17th, 19th centuries, we have these dramatically unfavorable moments of climate shift. The last uh, was the era of the world revolution of the West and also the birth of Malthusianism as we know it. Uh, this is important to keep in mind because of the tendency to overstate capitalism's resilience today. Uh, while it is true that climate change brings untold misery over the very short run, uh, over the middle and long run, the vast majority have done better. The vast majority in the Roman West did much better. Peasants reinvented village life, uh, class distinctions uh, disappeared, uh, relations between men and women equalized and fertility uh, uh, stabilized at a new lower level, uh, new livelihood, diverse livelihood strategies were pursued. This was a golden age for peasants. Similarly too, a thousand years later, at the dawn of the Little Ice Age, after the Black Death and the Great Class Revolts of the era, more on that in a moment, there was a golden age in the living standards for peasants and workers. So modes of production pivot on metal metabolic arrangements, but not reducible to their biophysicality. So metabolism can't be uh, conceptualized as a separate domain, but is rather a dimension of political, economic, cultural, and other uh, processes. And so as, as you've seen here, this is dramatic climate changes uh, in the Northern Hemisphere tend to destabilize modes of power and production, resulting either in developmental crises or epical crises. By the way, there's a story to be told for China and invasions from the, the uh, other side of the, of the Eurasian steppe as well. But for time, I'm going to just leave that uh, aside for the moment. So again, we have these moments of dramatically unfavorable climate change that are very, very bad for the extant arrangements of modes of production and reproduction because those modes of production and reproduction formed in an earlier climate era. So this is not climate determinism. This is that climate is always in terms of human history wrapped up with pretty much everything in human history. Climate is not emphatically not everything, but it is impossible to explain anything world historically without it. So uh, why is this so hard to see? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is the legacy of uh, modern environmentalism, especially its Anglo-American tradition, environmentalism in the rich countries. This is from the first Earth Day. It's an iconic poster. Anyone who studied Earth Day will have been familiar with this. Anyone who lived through it will have seen this. We have met the enemy and he is us. Keep in mind, this was in 1970. I have a whole riff of uh, around uh, what happened a week later, which was Nixon's illegal invasion of Cambodia uh, and one of the most horrific uh, train of events that followed from that. Uh, those people met the enemy and it looked uh, not like us. It looked like the American empire. So uh, I think this might connect with some of the things Eric was saying, I'm sorry I missed your talk, um, but that we are looking at not just epistemological questions, but at ruling abstractions. I won't walk you through all of this, but ruling abstractions are not thought abstractions. They are ruling abstractions are, in one sense, from Son Rethel, practical abstractions that emerge out of the formation of the law of value. On the other hand, Marx and Engels ruling ideas, that these become the ruling material force of society. They shape uh, um, uh, and determine the extent and compass of a historical epoch. Uh, read Anthropocene, if you will. So these, uh, these ruling abstractions pivot on the civilizing project on the one hand and nature on the other. And as we'll see, nature includes mo far more than forests and fields and soils and streams. It includes the vast majority of humankind who are expected to deliver sheep work uh, into uh, the, the uh, dynamics of capital and feed the accumulation of capital on a world 
scale. So this is one way to read this is Winter's overrepresentation of the bourgeoisie overrepresents itself as the best of humanity and it instrumentalizes that through civilizing projects, which requires the transformation of most humans into nature with an uppercase N. Why? To advance the rate of profit and to accumulate capital and to ensure the political and cultural conditions necessary to do that. So this model gets reinvented practically, geoculturally, one era after the other after the other. If we want to see a very practical metabolic snapshot of this, this is the ethnic, this is the primitive accumulation class formation ethnic cleansing dynamic of the English uh, invasion and conquest of Ireland, which was of course the conquest of the wild and savage people so that the civilized English could come in and uh, uh, impose their plantations. By the way, that's where we get the word plantations, uh, something that the plantation of scene literature has forgotten. So too, women became, in Silvia Federici's words, the savages of Europe. As always, this had a direct and immediate relationship to the rate of profit and to the exploitation of labor power, as well as to the extra economic appropriation of unpaid work. So this is the moment of the formation of what I will call the femitariat, that is the working classes, largely unpaid, who provide socially necessary unpaid work. It's linked to the formation of the bioteriot, the creation of a category of rule and domination and appropriation called nature to allow for the super exploitation of the web of life. Of course, this is not limited to gender. It is also the birth of modern racism. Why again? Well, we'll get to the practical uh, nitty gritty of it in a moment, but essentially this was the, the mechanism of super exploitation that necessary to fix the climate crisis of the long cold 17th century. So in other words, what we see, especially after 1550 and up to 1750, is the formation of a planetary proletariat in which the proletariat of wage work is, uh, stands on the pedestal of the socially necessary unpaid work of the femitariat and bioteriot. This is why relations of domination are fundamental to understanding capitalism's metabolisms. So nature in the web of life is and this is, is a way of understanding the dynamic of process and project, something the critics have largely ignored, probably because it poses uncomfortable uh, questions for them, that there is a process of the web of life, including human webs of life, including political movements, that is continually upsetting the best laid plans of the imperialist bourgeoisie. On the other hand, nature is the project of capitalist modernity, that is the project to appropriate and exploit paid work and unpaid work uh, as, as much as possible in, a, in the interest of advancing the rate of profit. So this is why civilizing projects are quite fundamental from Christianizing, civilizing, and after 1949 with Truman's point four, developmentalist projects, these have drawn and redrawn world color lines to create regimes of what? Of cheap nature with cheap labor at its pivot and justify them in the name of progress. Of course, today we have a new civilizing project that is sustainability, pardon me. So we wanna look at two key moments, which are uh, the long cold 14th century, the era of the crisis of feudalism, which was a climate class conjuncture had more to do with that. I've written a lot about this and I'm happy to answer questions about it. But essentially this was a moment of the revolutionary defeat of Europe's ruling classes and, and the forcing of feudalism's ruling strata to find a fix to uh, the crisis of feudalism outside of the logic of feudalism. Uh, the, the outlines of this approach were suggested about 50 years ago. Everyone pretty much ignores what Wallerstein writes here, but Wallerstein basically says, look, the crisis of feudalism was a climate conjuncture that unleashed a generalized class war, his words, in the European countryside, in which essentially Europe's ruling classes could not win. And then the triumph of capitalism was made possible and not guaranteed because the point of his book is that it was not guaranteed, but world ecology was altered by empires and bourgeoisies in a way which because of the social organization of emerging capitalism would primarily benefit Europe. So this is a moment of where the proletariat and bioteriot for, bio formation come together. 
And then also the very worst of the long cold 17th century between roughly 1550 and 1700, in which the financial, political, and military volatility of this era uh, is ultimately resolved through a series of climate fixes. So again, we can look basically right squarely at the top, just off the right to see, here's the general crisis of the 17th century. And we'll look at the Orbis spike in just a moment. By the way, the Orbis spike speaks to the first moment of capitalogenic crisis. Uh, so I just want to remind all of you of this, this uh, narrative arc that we have uh, the crisis of the Roman West in the fourth century, uh, not necessarily driven by climate refugees, but that was more or less the straw that broke the camel's back. And we can talk about the very interesting ways in which peasant revolts, the so-called Bacchidae, barbarian invasions and migrations, et cetera, uh, uh, conjoined with a political crisis and so on and so forth. But it's enough for now just to keep it in mind. The onset of the Little Ice Age in the 14th century, a geo-historical crisis, not man and nature, not a Malthusian crisis, as the neoclassical economists have it, but a climate class struggle in the web of life. Let's remember, climate conditions shape class capacities. That's an important thing to keep in mind against the human exemptionalism of Marx's class analysis. So this situation in 14th century Europe became absolutely ruinous for the states, for the seniors, for the merchants. There are a lot of reasons for this that I've talked, uh, uh, talked about at length elsewhere, but essentially this was an era of unprecedented peasant revolt. Nothing like this had been seen in Central and Western Europe ever. And so this is uh, 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 very instructive to keep in mind that the, and these are just the most dramatic moments, that what we see in Central and Western Europe is endemic class war from below in response to the endemic class assault from above to try to fix the crisis of feudalism. And that's not a small thing. So the rise of capitalism comes out of this historic class defeat. I'm gonna sort of gloss over a lot of very important nuance here just to cut right to the point. First of all, the conquest of the Americas was the appropriation of the unpaid work and energy of two continents. And in order to make that work, the Spaniards had to find cheap labor. Uh, the genocides were precisely that. They were not driven by, uh, they were not driven by the microbes and the viruses. The microbes and the viruses as such probably would have accounted for 25 to 35% of uh, uh, the depopulation, not 95%. And one of the, pr the proof is in the pudding. This is by uh, Koch, Lewis Maslin, and uh, a co-author's name escapes me, where you can see this map on the left indicates that the flashpoints of disease are the flashpoints of labor recruitment and commodity production and exchange in the new world. This is really, really fundamental if we want to understand today's crisis. It contributes directly to the first capital capitalogenic, that is made by capital, climate crisis, the so-called Orbis spike. Uh, this is from Maslin and Lewis's groundbreaking work. It contributes, it is not driving the process, volcanism, solar intensity, changes in the North Atlantic oscillation all come into play. But as you can see, the decarbonization that results as soils are left undisturbed and absorb more carbon as forests grow back, etc., is a significant moment in planetary history and very much a harbinger of today's crisis. Well, why is that? Why is it a harbinger of today's crisis? Because it is in this era that we see the birth of the climate class divide, climate patriarchy, climate apartheid. It was, as in the 14th century, this long cold 17th century, a, a, a moment of climate revolts and of, of extreme political turbulence and warfare, economic volatility, so on and so forth. And the fix was, as ever, as we know ever since, move to the frontier. This was the strategy of cheap nature. It was to use uh, military power to install commodity producing regimes and to enable the labor recruitment strategies, something of a euphemism uh, that would make it all go. What were those labor recruitment strategies? Well, first to uh, impress Native American uh, indigenous peoples into labor uh, through various kinds of concentration camp strategies, and then to go to Africa uh, to extract uh, millions of cheap and cheapened uh, human workers who were then racialized. They had to be racialized at that moment because of the dynamics of 
uh, of rule and of working class struggle. And great, indeed, you see this in northeastern Brazil and the sugar plantations where racial formation occurs precisely at the moment where indigenous and African slaves are aligning with each other and burning down plantations and engaging in guerrilla warfare in places like Bahia. So cheap nature is the planetary logic of ecogenocide. So the depopulation of, of indigenous populations leads to the reinvention and radical racialization of the proletarian relation in order to make the whole system of cheap labor, cheap nature go. So here again, you see the profound churning of capitalism's imperial metabolisms. Um, and again, this climate forcing, climate fixing dynamic. This is where we get European colonialism. Let's remember the first and, and basically central responsibility of the major European colonial empires was to pursue class formation as cheaply as possible through the civilizing project and the racist and sexist uh, uh, strategies that went with it. So this is why uh, super exploitation is fundamental to understanding capitalism's historical metabolisms. It is a dynamic of pushing beyond well above the average rate of exploitation, but extending the working day and also suppressing uh, the consumption of vast working classes that are uh, designated as not part of society. They are designated as part of nature. Remember Federici on the savages of Europe, uh, the monsters of Africa, et cetera, et cetera. And it was this dynamic that led to the true environment making revolution of capitalism, which exceeded uh, in it, uh, its uh, uh, feudal forebears by an order of magnitude in its scale, scope, and speed. So today's climate crisis is the result of this earlier climate fixing strategy in the long cold 17th century. So very quickly, because it bears directly on the question of Malthusianism and uh, of the Anthropocene, we also need to locate the, the, class, the, the class and popular revolts of the last great cold stretch of the Little Ice Age, roughly between 1780 and 1820. This is important that we want to keep this in mind here as we make sense of who, of Maltus. Maltus is everyone's whipping boy, and rightly so. But I want to situate Maltus a little bit differently. I don't think Maltus is writing about overpopulation. Indeed, Maltus had no empirical sense of England's population at the time he was writing. What was he writing uh, in response to? He was writing in response to the popular anti-colonial and uh, class revolts of the era. Indeed, England itself had become largely ungovernable. And this is also the moment of the plant uh, where the sort of maturing of the plantation revolution establishes the conditions for uh, the so-called uh, uh, industrial revolution uh, much later. Without cheap cotton, there was no industrial revolution. There's a story to be told around this, but essentially this was one of the appropriation of nature and from a Malthusian perspective, entirely reasonable. So we want to understand that the Malthusian moment is a moment, uh, is an ideological moment of the bourgeoisie's class struggle to maintain control and power on a world scale. Indeed, Maltus was the English, uh, the East India Company College's first chair in political economy. This would come up again after 1968, which I'm going to skip because uh, I think we need to wrap this up and really try to cut to the heart of the matter. So the Anthropocene, everyone knows the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is in its popular form, not its geological form, Malthusianism for polite company. Here's the conventional Anthropocene, nukes, chicken bones, plastics as a geological formation. But nearly all of the advocates, including the many of the geologists, slip into the popular Anthropocene. And many of these are recycled uh, either from 1968 or from 1798. And it's a quite uh, disturbing uh, list of uh, uh, features here. But I would say, of course, above all, there is the reification of history. There is a substitution of man and nature and the insertion of technical capacities as a benchmark for technological change. This is very much to see in the terms of the popular Anthropocene is very much to see like an empire. So what's at stake here? Well, sustainability as a class project, which it is, or planetary justice as a revolutionary project, the political ecology of modernity, man and nature, 
or class and nature, nature and class, and decisive historical geographical tipping points. So, or is it possible, as I've argued repeatedly, although people still misrepresent the point, is it the geohistorical capital of scene in the geological Anthropocene, which I'm sorry, does not begin in 1945. I'm with Lewis and Maslin. It begins with the Orbis spike in 1610. And that is a much more compelling marker if indeed we are looking for the origins of a geophysical turning point because the conquest of the Americas was a planetary biogeographical uh, transition in planetary history. Uh, the first time Pangaea was reestablished after 175 million years. So here's the potential of, of metabolism. I'll, I'll wrap this up in just two or three minutes. I know I'm a couple over time that we have two decisive moments of class formation that can, and crisis formation rather, that can be dialectically unified as a differentiated unity, a crisis of life making, a crisis of profit making. Uh, of course, we're all familiar here. This is just a few pictures. We all understand the enormity of the geophysical turning point. We all agree with this. The problem is, what is its relationship to the geohistorical structures of power, profit, and life in the capitalist world ecology? Uh, there's a, a, a lot of different uh, evidence one can mobilize around this long-term stagnation in labor productivity, agricultural productivity, the collapse in productive investment since the early 1970s, the non-appearance of automation, et cetera, et cetera. But this is uh, simply a, a chart from uh, Maito and Roberts uh, about the long-term secular decline in the rate of profit. And just to remind everyone, the reason why we talk about capitalism is because of the imminent struggle for advancing the rate of profit at any and all costs. It's not an abstract technological dynamic. It's not an abstract dynamic of rich people and poor people. It's a dynamic of class power and class struggle over the terms of the rate of profit and the valorization process. So the big questions are, is this a developmental crisis, one that will be resolved, or is it an ethical crisis through which we are seeing a transition from one mode of production to the next? So here's what I would say about uh, the, the widespread belief, especially on the left, of the resilience of capitalism, that capitalist class power relies on the great frontier. It, it relies on the metabolic commons that it has progressively enclosed since 1492, including dramatically the enclosure of the atmospheric commons. So just to remind you, dramatically unfavorable moments of climate shift are dramatically unfavorable. So now just a few reflections to close this off. First of all, I think from a dialectical perspective, metabolic arrangements emerge from contradictory unities, not from a priori basic units. Not an abstract system, not a city, not a country, not a, a nation. They are relational units that have to be constructed methodologically. Secondly, historical. Metabolisms are historically and geographically specific, including the specificity of the five centuries of the capitalist world ecology. They are not general phenomena. And indeed, because capitalism's incessant drive to render all relations world historical, capitalism's metabolic contradictions are seemingly everywhere, but they transform at specific turning points. Dialectical. Here's absolutely where I agree with Bellamy, Foster, and Burkett, even though they don't want to admit it. Metabolism is not a separate domain of biophysical life, but for Marx, an ontological historical premise. Hence, labor makes environments, environments make labor, to dramatically simplify. Uh, world accumulation, dialectically speaking, transformations of capital entail nonlinear reorganizations of the biosphere, which, by the way, aren't carried out by capital. They're carried out by empires, and which in turn, those tra biosphere transformations in turn necessitate nonlinear transformations of capital. What about the metabolic rift? Here, I'm largely in agreement with Bellamy Foster's original uh, sort of quadruple helix for formulation, transformations of class structure, capital, town country division of labor, and the geography of material flows are dialectically joined so that each transforms the other. And I would add also the questions of world hegemony and territorial power. Work, unpaid work, and capitalism's metabolisms. The metabolic contradictions are decisively shaped by the struggle to accumulate surplus value and over the distributions of worldwide surplus value, including the unpaid conditions and unpaid sources uh, that enable both the uh, advance of the rate of profit and the valorization 
of capital, that is the resolution of periodic overaccumulation crises. This involves the ruling abstraction nature and the dialectic of paid and unpaid work across the planetary proletariat, a proletariat, femitariat, and bioterriot. And then finally, we need intellectual disobedience. These reflections imply and indeed necessitate a revolt against the two cultures, against green arithmetic, against the disciplines, against multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. A world, a dialectical alternative, a world ecological alternative implicates the imperatives of joining together power, profit, and life as differentiated unities within a singular metabolism of historical capitalism. And finally, the climate crisis is a class struggle. The metabolism will aid us in confronting the capitalogenic climate crisis only insofar as we break with 19th century paradigms. Against the harmonization of man and nature and its logic of planetary management, we can engage the climate crisis as a differentiated imperialist metabolism of carbonization joined to the climate class divide, climate patriarchy, and climate apartheid. So thank you very much. Against sustainability for planetary justice, ecology without class struggle is gardening.